I'm Sheila Engel, and I'm a South Carolina author, and I mainly write about South Carolina heroines. Um, three of the books that I've written, well, really four, are about South Carolina heroines during the Revolutionary War. And if, as you can see, you are, we are in my office, uh, my office that serves as a sun porch that my husband built for me. Before I had a little cubby of a desk in the corner of our den, which worked, it was one of those with doors where I can open and shut it, depending on whether I wanted to use it or not. And um, I outgrew it, isn't that fantastic? It outgrew it. But uh, now I have a whole room and it's dedicated to my writing space as well as the wonderful sun that's coming in this morning. And I hope it's sun shining today at Cowpens also. I started writing because of some education courses that I was te teaching at University of South Carolina Upstate. I taught a class of uh, children's literature that all the elementary school teachers had to take. And then I taught a reading class for the secondary student that all the secondary teachers had to take. And what I realized as I was teaching these two classes is that there was very little, uh, in some cases, nothing about the women during the Revolutionary War. Why books had not been written about them, I don't know. There were compilations. Uh, Elizabeth Ellett, as we know, drew upon her many resources and published a couple of volumes about the women during the Revolutionary War, but nothing up to date. And now, of course, with everything that we can do with the internet and all that, we have information at our fingertips. But I went out on a visit to Walnut Grove here in, close to uh, where we live in Spartanburg. It's in Moore, South Carolina. And it was the home, childhood, I guess you would call it home, of Kate Moore Berry, who I had read about as a heroine during the Revolutionary War. In fact, as a member of the Kate Moore Berry chapter DAR, I was interested in finding out more about her. Well, I left there with an idea for a book that her story really needed to be told, that it was an important story. And so I started on that. And at age 58, I had my first book published, thanks to Hub City Books. So I want to introduce you to Kate. This is the cover of that particular book. And you, as you can see, hopefully that there's not a whole lot of, um, oh, let me fix this a little bit. Um, now, that's it looks better on my screen, that you see a woman on horseback dressed in colonial attire. And the reason that was chosen as the cover for the book is the fact that she was a scout and spy for her husband during the Revolutionary War. There, um, one of the stories that's told about Kate is the fact that there was a Sunday afternoon when she was on the porch of their home, uh, close to the Tiger River, when a man by the name of Captain Elliot and some of his Tories came to her home. They lined up across in front of her front porch. Her four children were with her and they demanded to know where her husband was. Of course, Kate as a staunch patriot a Whig at that time, a woman that whose family believed that they deserved their independence from King George III. She refused to tell Captain Elliot where her husband was. Her husband was captain of the Spartan militia, had an important job over in this area where we live right now to defend it against the Tories that it continued to harass and um, attack the different farms here in the area. So she refused. What did this Captain Elliot do? He pulled her arms behind her back, tied 
her to one of the uh, posts there on her porch and proceeded to harass her and not only harass her, but he hit her three different times trying to get the information from her. Can you imagine her screaming children at this point in the story, what they must have thought of this man, this man that was obviously an enemy, uh, was doing to their mother. Finally, he stopped. Why? We don't know, but he finally stopped and told his men that they didn't need to get the information from Mrs. Berry that they would find the Spartan militia on their own. Just to put it in perspective, this was her own front porch. And this is something I think we don't realize so much about the Revolutionary War, but it was fought in people's houses, on their front porch, in their backyards. It was not on battlefields so often. It was very, very personal. And these Scotch-Irish Presbyterians that had come over here looking for religious freedom and looking for freedom from the English who were keeping them down as far as society was concerned was very, very important to them. So she refused. And I think that shows us just one example in her life, the importance of independence and freedom from Great Britain. Another thing that's important about Kate, as a scout for her husband's militia group, she was the one that got that particular militia group over to the Battle of Calpians. That, and these militia men, including her husband, and including her brother Thomas, helped fight that particular battle. Can you imagine going around and knocking on doors and hollering at fence posts and all the ways she must have used to get the information out that they needed to meet General Daniel Morgan at the Campions. So very, very important. And we can celebrate this particular victory 240 years later at, on January the 17th, 2020, because of women like her. The second book that I wrote about another Scotch-Irish woman is a book called Fearless Martha. You see her, another woman in colonial dress with her, with her son William, and she's standing in front of, obviously, Tory soldiers. This was their uniform. You, would see, you see one in red, one in green, the green dragoon to the left of your screen. And they were there. Can you tell that it's her house again? So we're on another woman's front porch. This particular home, it's in Brattonsville, South Carolina. It would have been in the new acquisition during the 18th century. And her particular home is still standing in Brattonsville. So I would encourage you to visit her home and you can stand on that same front porch and see where she defended her home and hearth from these invaders that were right there. What they wanted to do, what they wanted to know when they came to her home in early July 1780, she, they wanted to know where her husband was, where William Bratton was, where his militia group was. And not only did they ask her questions, but I want you to, sh I want to show you something that they grabbed from behind her there on the front porch. This is a sickle. This would have been a tool that she would have been using in the wheat fields before they came. She would have been using it to cut the stalks down because it was wheat it's time for the harvest. One of those Tories picked up the sickle, put it to Martha's throat, and threatened her with death, and I'm going to put this down, threatened her with death if she did not tell them where William was. So here's another woman that in her own, outside her own home, she's threatened to get information from her about 
see what they would have called, the Tories would have called rebel troops. Captain Christian Huck was in charge of these particular this particular group of over a hundred men. They were of the Green Dragoons. They were Tories. Um, also, a, a, quite a group of men. He was a Philadelphia lawyer that had been given the order to calm down the rebellion. And when I say rebellion, this would have been the patriots that were rebelling against King George, and he was given the order to do this, and he did it by stunts like this, by harassment, by terrorizing. He burned houses, he burned churches, he uh, took, stole animals, did all sorts of things to deal with the people, but he didn't succeed. He didn't succeed. The next day, because of Martha's bravery, because she had sent one of their slaves, a man by the name of White, to where her husband was with Colonel Sumter. And they came back and attacked that particular night and saw to it that Captain Christian Huck's uh, mission, I think I'll call it a mission, was curtailed in quite the different order. Another thing that, another story that we know about Martha, and it, again, it was in the summer of 1780. As you know, records are scant. They are almost non-existent in some places as far as during this time, because not much was written down. And there was a barrel of gunpowder. Our governor, our South Carolina governor, at the time, had sent barrels of this gunpowder out to men, uh, families in the upcountry from Charleston to hide in case they needed it for, to fight against the British. And so the Brattons had been one of those families that this uh, barrel of gunpowder was sent to. So they had hidden it in a rotten tree close to their uh, home, not uh, not really close, but away from it enough so it would not have been easily found. And somebody um, had heard about it and told the Tories in the neighborhood, and they were after that barrel of gunpowder. Of course, this, this is war. This is what they did. Well, somebody warned Martha that they were going to try to find the barrel of gunpowder powder. And so she got on her horse, went straight for the tree, where, which of course she knew where it was. She had a pistol with her. She took the barrel of gunpowder and poured the gunpowder from the tree and across into the path there. And then she took her pistol, shot at it, caused a spark that started a fire that sent the fire to the barrel and blew it up in the rotten tree at the same time. About the time all the uh, brush and the trees and the gunpowder and the smoke and fire and all that was going on, those Tories showed up. And of course, they were startled. They, did, they were perturbed that they did not get the gunpowder. They knew exactly what had happened. And they started looking around for the men that had done this. Of course, there were no men. And uh, two of the soldiers came back to the captain with Martha's help holding her arms. And his question to her was, where are the men that did this? She looked him straight in the eye and said, it was I that destroyed that gunpowder. Surprised, startled a little bit. Um, startled that it was not some of the soldiers that, that did it. But again, this shows that these women during the Revolutionary War were soldiers just like their men. Maybe they weren't marching. Maybe they weren't sleeping on the grounds at night. They were defending their home. They were the, defending their colony just like the men were. The third person that I wrote about was a woman by the name of Elizabeth Hutchinson Jackson. 
This is Andrew Jackson's mother. And you can't go to see her home because it is long gone, but you can go and visit the Andrew Jackson State Park, which has a replica set up for what his home might have looked like, a loom there that uh, would have been the one that similar to what Elizabeth used. There's also a, a small house that have, would have been possible to look like the school that Andy and his brothers attended. But they came from Ireland also. They, this couple, Andrew and Elizabeth, with their two young son, a three-year-old Hugh and a one-year-old Robert, came to America. And they came into Charleston and then went up the Camden Salisbury Trail Road and went to the Waxiles, as it was called. Then. Of course, now we would know it as Lancaster County. And the fact there is that she had sisters that had already immigrated, sisters and their families that had already immigrated to Carolina. So it was like a homecoming when they came in. It was not like a place where they knew nobody. And so Andrew brought some, bought some land and they started settling there. Uh, a couple of years later, Andrew died out of an accident. She was almost nine months pregnant with her third son, Andrew. And of course, this would have left her a widow with three small children. Her, one of her sisters, who had been sick for a long time, asked her to come and live with them. And of course, her husband was delighted also. They had eight children. And with the sister that had been in such ill health needed some help in the home. So Elizabeth moved in with them and helped man the um, home fires for 14 people. And she did an excellent job. She made some extra money herself by weaving, and her work was well known. She became involved in the community and the church there and was a woman that um, was well looked, uh, looked at with some, quite a bit of esteem. So then we have May of 1780 when Charleston fell to Lord Cornwallis. And of course he sent his troops into the upstate as, as we would call it now of South Carolina, wanting to get rid of as many of the um, rebels, as they called the patriots, as he could. We see the Battle of Waxhaws happening about 10 days later. And at that particular battle, I think it's important to note that Elizabeth, along with her two sons, 12 and 14 years old, Andy 12 and Robert 14, were three of the people that went into the grounds after the battle was over to help the wounded men, the dying men that were just butchered by during this particular battle. But that's not the only thing we know specifically about Elizabeth. She finally let her two younger sons join the militia. Uh, at ages 14 and 16, they were captured and captured and taken to the Camden Jail. Colonel Rowden was the uh, manager of the jail. Superintendent, I guess we would call him today. He was the one that made the decisions and this jail was awful for the Patriots. It was full of smallpox, dysentery, all the kinds of things when you are, that happen in a dirty place, in a place where there's not enough food, there's not enough water, and all those different things. So of course, Andy and Robert caught the smallpox also. Robert seemed to have a worse case than Andy. And with that, Elizabeth knowing that these were just boys, they were her boys. She'd already lost a husband in this country. She'd already already lost her son Hugh, her oldest son. He had died after the Battle of Stono Ferry. She did not want to lose any more 
of her family. And so she took it upon herself to get a couple of old nags and took two days to get down to the Camden Jail. She had the audacity, I'm going to use that word, to go into the commander's office. She, it wasn't her porch. She was going right into to the enemy den, if you will, to have her sons released. There's no record of why Colonel Rowden chose to allow Robert and Andy to be released into her care. As I said, they both had smallpox. Perhaps it was just so overcrowded, he was glad to get rid of a couple people, maybe thought that they would take the smallpox back to their homes and, of course, deal with it there. Whatever, for whatever reason, she took her boys out of that Camden jail. Took them home. Robert died shortly thereafter. Andy, she was able to get back on his feet that summer of 1780. And then in the fall, she and two of her friends there in the Waxhaws decided that they needed to go to Charlestown. Charlestown, outside of it, like so many of the other larger cities, Philadelphia and New York City, had prison ships in the harbor. And on these prison ships, you can imagine the conditions were just as bad, if not worse, as in one of the jails. Elizabeth found out that two of those nephews that she had helped raise were on one of those ships and she wanted to bring them, take them comfort. She wanted to take them some food. She wanted to let them know that they had not been forgotten. And so these women took off for Charleston. Unfortunately, Elizabeth caught one of those ship's fevers and died. Andy never found out where his mother was buried, but he had learned so much from her that we see him becoming a man of integrity and a, man, a strong man of character that, of course, eventually was one of our presidents. So these are just three snippets of the stories of three of these very strong women here in South Carolina that I've had the joy of writing about. I think that on this anniversary of the Battle of Calpians, it's important that we remember the men and the women that fought for our country. Thank you for paying attention to this today. I hope you're going to visit Calpens when you can. I hope you're going to go to reenactments across the state when you can. Visit one of these houses. They're open short hours and some not so much right now during the pandemic. But the thing is, you get the opportunity to walk where these patriots walked, where they fought not on a battlefield necessarily, but on their own land, on their own porches, wherever they needed to be to defend the rights of independence that was written about in our Declaration of Independence. Thank you so much for listening and I encourage you once again to see about our history, to enjoy the stories, because they are many. And I want you to join me in saying happy celebration to those that here at the National Park Service that are showing us such a good way to celebrate our country's history. Thank you.